This is the city, Los Angeles, California. In the rolling hills just above Sunset Boulevard lies the exclusive community of Bel Air. It all looks quiet and serene, just as it did on the morning of November 6th, 1961. On that day, Fire Chief Sawyer received a call about a small brush fire in the area. The fire raged out of control for three days. It consumed 484 houses, 21 buildings, and destroyed 6,000 acres of watershed. The fire was finally controlled. Not one life was lost. Bel Air has rebuilt its houses, and most of the burn scars have been healed. Nature can sometimes create havoc for a city. So can some of its people. When they do, I go to work. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Thursday, October 24th. We were working the day watch out of Fraud's division. The boss is Captain Frankel. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. We had just concluded a case involving a trick card artist. It was a simple bunco, but a lucrative one for the swindler. 50 victims had paid $5 each for a fast look at a quick-changing playing card. to believe this joke store novelty could earn 200 bucks. Yeah. Simple kid's magic gimmick. Sliding panels built into the card. Push up, king of hearts. Push down, queen of spades. The guy who invented playing cards came up with 52 licenses to steal, didn't he? Yeah. Hand me that arrest report, would you? Thank you. Frauds Division Friday. Yes, sir, that's correct. The machine did what, sir? Yes, sir, I understand. And what is your name? Yes, sir. Friday. Sergeant Friday. In about 15 minutes. Yes, sir. Goodbye. Department of Employment. You think in a change in jobs? Their computer came up with a message. What do you mean? Seems a man has been collecting disability checks for the past six months. Something wrong with that? Yeah, a little. The man's been dead for nearly a year. 10.30 AM, we arrived at the Department of Employment. The supervisor of data processing was the man who had called us. His name was Harvey Peterson. He was waiting for us in the computer section. All disability claims are first recorded, as you can see, on these computer cards. And now let's step across the hall. The next step is to place those cards into a card reader, which puts them on tape. This is the card reader. Now the information on those cards has been placed on magnetic tape. Is that right? The card reader is connected by way of wires to this machine, the central processor. We call it the memory. The information from the card is loaded into the memory, and the computer validates the data. Validates the data? Well, for example, it checks that the Social Security number has the required nine digits. After it's been validated, it's written onto magnetic tape. Uh, that's the magnetic tape machine. Rewind it, and it places the information in sequence. In sequence? Uh, in order, uh, according to Social Security number, for instance. And from there, it goes to our high-speed printer. Now that you have some small inkling of what these machines are all about, now let's show you what turned up this morning. Mike? That's our console typewriter. Uh, we use it for communicating with the computers. Mike is requesting information on the social security number in question.
The computer is now searching for that record. Illegal transaction. Reason for rejection, record marked deceased. Is it possible that someone punched the wrong social security number? No, we checked it out. The social security number on the disability claim matched. But that number belonged to a Tom Mavis. And Mr. Mavis died last November. Now the name on this card is Robert F. Rosen. And this Rosen, whoever he is, has collected disability claim checks for six months, according to our records. Well, how come the computer didn't say anything before now? because the computer had never been notified that Mavis had passed on. As far as the computer knew, that social security number was still on the active list. Why was that? Well, that's what we'd like you to find out. It was 11.15. We went up to Peterson's office. When Mr. Mavis died, that fact should have been written on a form like this. Then it would have been registered on a computer card, which in turn would have coded the fact that his social security number was invalid, that it was no longer active. But the computer never received that information. It knows now. Why is that? Luck, Sergeant Friday. This morning, Mavis's widow came in after all this time because she thought her husband hadn't received the last disability check he was entitled to. Well, it was at that time that we discovered that Mavis's social security number had only been placed on the inactive file a month ago. Before that, it had been very active indeed. It couldn't have been an honest mistake? No, Officer Gannon. The checks have been cashed. Well, then someone intercepted the form that would have notified the computer of Mavis's death. And reassigned his social security number. That's what we think. Just no other way. Is it hard to get hold of these death notices before they reach the computer? Anyone in the department could do it, if he set his mind to it. How's that, sir? We're supposed to be here to help others. Someone's been helping himself. Maybe there's another problem. What's that? The way it looks to me, there could be any number of phony claims going through that we don't even know about. 11.35 a.m., Bill and I drove out to 8148 Granger Avenue. According to the information on the computer card, that was the address of Robert F. Rosen. No Rosen listed here. Here's the manager, Ferguson, apartment A. Yeah, you fellas looking for an apartment? Got a nice upstairs corner, two bedrooms, plenty of sun. You're Mr. Ferguson? Ain't ashamed to admit it. Police officers, this is Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. Then you're not looking for an apartment? No, sir. We're looking for a man by the name of Robert F. Rosen. We understand he lives here. No, he lived here. He moved? About a month ago, I'd say. How long did he live here? Oh, five, six months. Did he leave any forwarding address? No. Nope. Could you describe him? Yeah. Well, would you describe him? Yeah. About my height, my weight, maybe a few pounds less. Around 5'9", 5'10", 160 pounds? About. Kind of long, blonde hair and a little pointy beard, wore sunglasses. Would you say he was a hippie? Not exactly. Too old for that. Must be about 35. I just figured he was in show business, you know. Did he live here alone? Well, it was just him, all right, but I wouldn't hardly say he lived here. He never exactly got around to moving in. Well, how's that? Well, he just came by once in a while to check his mailbox. Didn't that strike you as a little strange? It did, but I don't know he's into my tenant's business. Is that right? Paid his rent on time. Paid cash, too. No wear or tear on the apartment. And you couldn't ask for a quieter tenant. All right, sir, I wonder if we might see a copy of Rosen's lease. Oh, I don't bother with leases. Just a mess of paperwork. Ain't no trick to break a lease, so why bother with them is the way I look at it. First and last month's rent is all I ask for. Nowadays, everyone's got ants in his britches. No one sits still for a year at a time. Now, leases ain't worth the paper they're printed on. I see. Well, anything else you can tell us about this, Rosen? Mm, no, I think I've just about covered that particular subject. Uh, what is it you want him for? Routine investigation. Uh-huh. Well, maybe you ought to question the Green Palms apartment while you're at it. Why is that? Well, Howie Levin, he manages the Green Palms. Big place corner of Sunrise and Cedar. I was mentioning to him at the last meeting of the North Hollywood Apartment Owners Association that I had this strange bird Rosen renting from me. Would you go on, please? I told him I was getting 125 a month rent just for my mailbox, and old Howie topped me. Is that right? Yeah, he told me he had the same sort of tenant over at the Green Palms paying him 140. I tell you boys, tenants like that don't grow on trees. Twelve oh three p.m. We drove over to the Green Palms Apartments to talk to Howard Levin.
I'm Howie Levin, the manager of the Green Palms. Yes, sir. Police officers, Mr. Levin. Is anything the matter? No, sir. We'd just like to ask you a few questions. Well, I'd invite you in, but I just put all my furniture in my last vacancy. All I got left is a rug. We could sit on that if you want to. No, sir. We can talk out here. Fine. What can I do to help you? We understand from your friend, Mr. Ferguson, that you have a tenant who rents an apartment but only uses his mailbox. Oh, Cooper. Arnold Cooper. He's not my tenant anymore. Not that he ever was. Like you say, he only used the mailbox. When did he stop using it, Mr. Levin? It's been about a month. I can check if you need the exact date. How long did he pay rent? I'd say four months. Can you describe him? Well, as you know, I, uh, he was about 40 years old, and he wore horn rim glasses, and he had a hearing aid in his ear. What about his height and weight? Oh, about 6'1", I guess. How much did he weigh? Oh, I'm not too good on weights. Well, was he fat? Was he thin? Medium. Did Cooper have a lease? No, Mr. Tetley. He's the owner of the Green Palms. He doesn't require leases. Did Cooper leave a forwarding address for his mail? No, sir, he did not. All right, sir. I'm going to leave you one of our cards. If you should think of anything, we'd appreciate a call. Sure thing. Sergeant Joe Faraday. No, sir, that's Friday. Sure. What did this Cooper fella do? What do you want him for? We just want to ask him a few questions. I see. Thank you very much for your cooperation, Mr. Levin. Anytime. Is this going to be in the papers? We wouldn't know about that, sir. Well, I'll give you one of our cards, Sergeant Faraday. Oh, that's yours. Uh, I'd sure appreciate it if you pass it along to the reporters. We advertise in the classifieds, but a mention on the front page never hurt no one. As Mr. Tetley says, free advertising is the best money can buy. One forty-five p.m., we return to the Department of Employment. The M.O. of Arnold Cooper matched that of Robert F. Rosen, so we had Peterson run a check on his name. The computer confirmed our suspicions. 14 disability claim checks had been mailed to Arnold Cooper at the Sunrise Street address. A check on Cooper's social security number indicated that it had once belonged to a Bernard L. Kramer. Illegal transaction. Reason for rejection, record marked deceased. If the computer knows that this Bernard L. Kramer is dead, why was it sending out checks to Cooper? I don't get it, Mr. Peterson. Well, again, the computer apparently only found out recently. In other words, whoever has been intercepting the notices of death, keeping the information from the computers, sooner or later sends the information along. Is that right? As soon as the suspects figure their landlords may start getting too suspicious, they move to another apartment with another name and another social security number. And whoever their inside contact is simply brings the computer up to date by sending along the death form with a new date on it. Uh, you said suspects. Looks that way. So far, we have at least Rosen and Cooper, and who knows how many others we don't know about. Is there any way for us to unwind this thing at your end? Well, how do you mean? Well, is there some way for us to find out who's been supplying these people with the Social Security numbers? How many employees do you have who might have access to the files? Hundreds. Just about anyone who works in any of our offices. I guess that doesn't narrow it down very much, does it? No, sir, I'm afraid not. You know, Mr. Peterson, maybe it's true what you read. I mean, about computers eventually putting everyone out of work. No, sir. There'll always be work for people who build and design them, and those who run maintenance on them, and, of course, those who feed information into them. And as long as there are people who can get rich by not feeding the information into them. Yes? We'll never be out of work. Since our only two leads had valley addresses, we decided to attend the monthly meeting of the North Hollywood Apartment Owners Association. May I have your attention for a minute? Before we adjourn for coffee and donuts, Sergeant Joe Friday of the Los Angeles Police Department has a few words for us. Sergeant Friday? Thank you, Mr. Hanks. We're faced with a problem. Now, maybe you folks can help us. If any of you are running apartments to people who are suspicious, we'd like to know about it. Specifically, people who don't live in the apartments after renting them, but who just come around to pick up their mail. Now, if you've had any such tenants, please be good enough to tell us. If you get any in the future, please notify us. I'm going to leave some of our cards with Mr. Hinks. has our telephone number on it. We'd appreciate a call. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergeant. Sergeant Friday. Yes, sir. I had a tenant like that a few months ago. You want to tell us about it? Well, it's like you said. He never exactly moved in. He just came by to collect his mail. What was his name? Jackson. Gary Jackson. Could you describe him? 
Ordinary looking guy. Late 30s, I'd figure. About 6'1", medium build. What color hair? Blonde. Who wore it in a crew cut? It was an ordinary looking fella, except for that scar. What kind of scar? Oh, it was a doozy. Run halfway down his face. Shrapnel wound. Got it in Korea. Now, you told us this Jackson didn't live in the apartment after he rented it. Didn't you ever wonder why? <laughs> I never had a chance to wonder. I never saw him after he rented. And then he moved out. Uh, my name is Grange. I own 24 units for Heavenly Arms over on Ryder Place. I had a tenant like you were talking about about a year ago. Name was uh, Bunsen. He came and went two or three months. Just came by to collect his mail. Do you remember what he looked like? A little taller than you, as I recall. Had a big nose. Any marks or scars? No, but that nose you wouldn't forget. You wouldn't ever forget it. I got a tenant now. He's got big ears, like an elephant. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Anytime. Officers, my name is Elvira Norton. I want to cooperate. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any information for us? I certainly do. I want you to know if I ever have a tenant like the one you described, I'll surely call you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Norton. We'd appreciate that. Just want to do my part. Yes, ma'am. I even have one of those support your local police bumper stickers on my front door. On your front door? I don't drive. Monday, November 18th. Over three weeks had gone by. Peterson had confirmed that both Bunsen and Jackson had received disability claim checks from the Department of Employment, but no new leads had developed on the case. 2.15 p.m. A lot of things don't square on this one, Joe. Like what? I can't exactly put my finger on it. Well, usually we don't have anything to go on. This time I have the feeling we almost have too much. We have all these descriptions. Rosen, Cooper, Bunsen, Jackson. Not one of them has turned up in our mug file. I know. It's been bugging me, too. There are just too many people involved in this one. This is the sort of job that calls for two, maybe three people. We've already got five, figuring whoever's working the inside. No, it doesn't make sense. I know. And these descriptions, listen to them again. Rosen, long blonde hair, Van Dyke beard, sunglasses. Cooper, horn rim glasses, hearing aid. Jackson had a scar. Bunsen had a nose like Jimmy Durante. The next one will probably be the tattooed man or he'll have two heads. Are you thinking what I think you're thinking? Just a hunch, pal. I'm guessing when you take away the sunglasses and the beard and the scar and all the rest of that stuff, you've got one man. I think you might be right. Aside from their various trademarks, the descriptions of all five are pretty close, medium build. About six feet, six one. You think the guy's an actor? Yeah, he could be an actor or maybe somebody who got a makeup kit for his birthday. I don't think it'd hurt to pick up those canceled checks from Peterson and let Frank and question documents analyze the handwriting. Right now. 2.45 p.m., we arrived at the Department of Employment. Peterson gave us the canceled checks, which had been signed by suspects Rosen, Cooper, Bunsen, and Jackson. 3.15 p.m., we went back to the police building. We took the canceled checks directly to Frank Silver in the question documents section of SID. Hi, Frank. Joe, Bill, what's up? Got a few signatures we'd like you to take a look at if you got a minute. Sure thing. Forgery? No hints, Frank. You're on your own. Fair enough. Muddy E's, big loops, double loops on the O's, nice slant. Well, gents, what would you like to know? How many people are we dealing with on this? One, Joe. You positive, Frank? Definitely. There's been no attempt to disguise the signature. Here, look for yourselves. Look at the E's in Robert Rosen and compare them to the E's in Jerry Bunsen and Arnold Cooper. Look how muddy all those E's are. There's no white space in the letter at all. And notice how all the O's have double loops at the top. Very unusual. And yet all four names share that characteristic. See? There are O's in all of them. See how they all have double loops? Yeah. Unusual. And here, notice how lush and full all the letters with loops are. The J in Jackson, the J in Jerry, the P in Cooper. And all the capital letters are extremely full-blown. Do you notice how out of proportion they are to the lowercase letters? Yeah. In addition to which, all the signatures have exactly the same angle of slant. One man. He'd never make it in forgery, Joe. Well, now, don't you worry about him, Frank. He's been doing just great in frauds. <laughs> 3.35 p.m., we went back to Fraud's Division. Fraud's Division, Friday. Yes, ma'am, I remember. Yes? Yes, Mrs. Norton? Uh-huh. Yes, ma'am, you did exactly right. All right, now try to stall him as long as you can without making him suspicious. We'll be right over. Yes, ma'am. 
was Elvira Norton, the lady we met at the North Hollywood apartment owner's meeting. She rented an apartment to someone named Clarence Fisher about three weeks ago. He never moved in. Today he came by to pick up his mail. She's stalling him in her apartment. She got his license number. You think this Fisher's our boy? If he's got muddy E's and big loops, he's our boy. We called communications and requested a rolling make on the license number Elvira Norton had given us. The car was registered to a Peggy Thompson, 4211 Carmel Avenue. I, I tried to stall him, but he left. I'll check this Thompson woman out with Peterson. And while he's at it, have him check on Clarence Fisher. I was outside and I saw him drive up. That's when I copied down his license number. He took a letter from his mailbox and he was getting ready to leave when I asked him into my apartment. I told him the Apartment Owners Association had requested information from all of its members regarding their tenants. Age, place of birth, that sort of thing. You know, like a survey. I was afraid he was going to leave when I came out here in the hall to phone you. Well, he was still in there when I got back, but I could see he was impatient and I didn't want him to get suspicious. Yes, ma'am, you did the right thing. He seems like a very nice young man. He says he's just waiting for his wife and family to drive out from Florida before moving into his apartment. Could you describe him? Well, he's quite tall. Has a limp, poor man. A limp? Yes, he hurt himself surfing when he was in Florida. He was a surfing champion of all Florida before his injury. Oh, and he had those funny sideburns. Uh, what do you call them? Uh, lamb chops? Mutton chops? That's it. I talked to Peterson. According to the computer, Clarence Fisher was mailed a disability check yesterday. Must be that surfing injury. Yes, ma'am. Peggy Thompson works for the Department of Employment. Been there five years. Yeah. I got a good description of the girl to go on. Peterson says she left work early today. She seemed upset. She's got a reason to be. The Department of Employment had given Bill Peggy Thompson's address. 4.45 p.m. We arrived at her apartment. Is that you, honey? No, sweetheart. Police officers. I didn't call the police. You should have called your barber. All right, stand still. What's this all about? He's clean. What's your name? Paul Nichols. How long you lived here? Why all the questions? Oh, we've got more, Nichols. We have questions about Social Security numbers and disability claims and empty apartments. A lot of questions. Now, if they get too tough, you ask your friends for help. My friends? Bunsen, Jackson, Rosen, Cooper, Fisher. Oh, and let's not forget Peggy Thompson. I don't know what you're talking about. It's my duty to inform you that you have the right to remain silent during all questioning. If you waive that right, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to the presence of an attorney during all questioning. If you cannot afford one, one will be appointed for you. Now, do you understand that? Sure, but I don't understand what you're doing here. I haven't done anything. Disability checks. One made out to Clarence Fisher and a new one, Tom Malcolm. Now, do you know what we're doing here? Peggy had nothing to do with it. It was all my idea. Peggy never wanted to do it. She's innocent. That's not up to us to decide. What did we do that was so terrible? We weren't even greedy. In two years, we've only taken about 40,000. Most people would have taken a lot more. Correction, fella. Most people wouldn't have taken anything. What's $40,000 to the state of California? It's called embezzlement. just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 11th, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The suspects were tried and convicted of violation of the State Penal Code, Section 504, embezzlement of public funds. The penalty prescribed by law is imprisonment in the state prison for not less than one year, nor more than 10 years. 